And it is my honor today to introduce our first plenary speaker, Karen Warkington. Karen is professor at Boston University, and there are also Smith, uh, research associates at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. I have known Karen for many years, as I was fortunate to meet her in Panama in Gamboa, where we both do field work, and they have been an inspirational mentor. Karen is an integrative and comparative biologist interested in phenotypic plasticity, development, behavior, and critical transition points. They work mostly on frog eggs and are known for the discovery of predator induced hatching and their integrative work on environmental cue hatching. They're they also work in a new field, biotremology. If you don't know about it, it was new to me a few years ago when, she told, when they told me about it. And they study how embryos use incidental vibrational cues from predators to make life and death hatching decisions. This has been an 18 year long project and Karen wants me to highlight that this has been a long collaboration with vibrations engineer, Greg McDaniel. So working across disciplines, they have created new tools and methods to ask questions about how animals use vibrational information. Even though vibration sensing is widespread and really important in animal lives, we know relatively little about how it compares to sound and vision, the ways we humans communicate. This discrepancy of effort and knowledge reflects our own human sensory biases. And it's probably not the only way our own biology affects what we know about, about life more broadly. And Karen's talk today will really illustrate this point. Finally, it is worth mentioning that over the last decade, half of Karen's teaching has been in gender and sexuality studies in collaboration with humanists and social scientists. Karen brings things we biologists know about diversity and plasticity into interdisciplinary conversations and at the same time, Karen brings gender and sexuality studies insights back to us biologists, melting them together, melting these two sides of their life and career for general audiences. So without further ado, I will let Karen talk. The title is Crossing Boundaries, Disrupting Binaries, A Queer Perspective on Style and Behavioral Diversity. Go ahead, Karen. Thank you so much. Uh to Tim Wright for inviting me and to my academic sister, Humana, for that introduction. Um, so today I'll talk about science as a social process and some things I've learned from frogs. I'll discuss some social science on gender and sexual minorities in STEM, uh, consider heteronormativity as the problem for people and for science, and then look at animal sexual diversity and how we think about it. I'll share a bit of personal history and three lessons from boundary crossing frogs. I'll address how gender binary thinking is a self reinforcing cycle and discuss how the biology of sexual variation uh, can disrupt binaries and we can use it to make biology more inclusive and I think better. So life is amazingly diverse and one of our tasks and our joys as biologists is to discover and try to understand that diversity. But a challenge of this work is that sometimes what we know or think we know limits our approaches to things that don't fit our expectations, whether those expectations come from scientific knowledge, from life experience, or even our own biology as humans. And as Jimena said, our relative knowledge of uh, visual acoustic vibrational communication probably reflects human biases more than their importance across life forms in general. And if we were hermaphrodites, we would likely be less attached to essentialist binary thinking about sex and gender. So observations of unexpected variation sometimes raise questions that generate new research directions that can overturn established knowledge. And I'll show you some examples from our work with frogs. And often that variation is not new and indeed others had seen it before, but they saw it from a different perspective. And this is one of the reasons why diversity in science is important because different people with different identities and different life experiences notice different things, ask different questions and pursue different research. Moreover, interacting with people who are different from ourselves improves everyone's thinking in multiple ways. And this benefits both majority group members and minorities. So, all aspects of human diversity matter for science, but today I'm gonna focus on gender and sexuality. 
So among countries, the legal status of gender and sexual minorities varies a lot from constitutional protection to the death penalty. ILGA.org keeps an up-to-date list if you wanna check the laws in a particular country. And in the US, legal protections vary among states and they're actively contested. So in 2021, state legislators already broke a record by proposing the largest number of anti-transgender bills in US history. And legal protection doesn't guarantee equality. So despite it, LGBT employees are underrepresented in STEM-related US federal agencies by about 18 to 20% compared to the population at large, and 13% compared to non-STEM federal agencies. And those employees also report lower workplace fairness and job satisfaction than straight colleagues in STEM and LGBT employees in non-STEM agencies. Indeed, LGBTQ Q professionals in STEM face systemic inequalities. So in a recent survey of 21 STEM professional societies, LGBTQ respondents report more career limitations, social exclusion, harassment, and professional devaluation than their heterosexual cisgender uh, colleagues. Moreover, these negative experiences were associated with a greater incidence of health problems and the intent to leave science. So sexual minority students leave STEM fields at disproportionately high rates. A study of over 4,000 STEM freshmen found that as seniors, 8% identified as sexual minorities. And compared to heterosexuals and controlling for things like undergraduate research experience, those sexual minority students were almost 10% more likely to have left STEM than expected. And this attrition rate is higher even than for female students. So one thing that makes science less welcoming to queer folk is heteronormativity. This is the routine assumption of heterosexuality and associated behaviors, family structures, life history traits, et cetera. It tends to make certain kinds of variation invisible while visible difference is queer or odd and needs explanation. Meanwhile, normative traits are naturalized unquestioned and unexamined. And of course, the concept of normativity does not just pertain to sexuality, it's generally relevant for social inequalities. So for instance, my whiteness as a professor and as a plenary speaker is unremarkable. So cis normativity is a parallel term for the assumption and naturalization of a binary division and conventional alignment of gender identity and sex. And so obviously heteronormativity and cisnormativity affect how we see or don't see queer families. So for instance, Andine is not obviously recognizable as my partner in most contexts, but also affects many other families. So in general, Brad is easily recognized as my brother, but Peter is not, and I have to tell people. So heteronormativity uh, can affect our observations of other species what we notice, what we record, and how we interpret what we see. We tend to interpret courting and mating animals as males and females, but they aren't always. So in these garter snakes, cold males emerging from hibernacula temporarily release female pheromones, attracting courtship by warmer males, which helps the cold ones warm up and protects them from predatory birds. And such phenomena may often go unrecognized. So same-sex sexual behavior is now documented in many hundreds of species, typically by individuals that also mate heterosexually. And it's estimated to occur in about 15 to 30% of mammal and bird species. But we don't yet have good estimates for other taxa. And this information about animal behavior has accumulated in parallel with increasing visibility of gender and sexual diversity in many human societies. So in animals, same-sex sexual behavior takes many different forms, ranging from indiscriminate mating to enduring multifaceted sexual and social bonds. So there can be non-adaptive reasons for any behavior. So same-sex mating could simply be a retained ancestral trait or 
uh, an incidental side effect of adaptive traits. But of course, when a trait is expressed, it is available for selection. Uh, and there is substantial evidence for non-reproductive functions of sexual behavior, including in same-sex context. So this should not surprise us, right? Because it's well established that traits evolved in one context like dinosaur feathers can later gain new functions. And selection to bring gametes together for fertilization has led to the evolution of a wide range of morphological, physiological, and behavioral traits that now also affect fitness in other ways. Indeed, studying sexual behavior in contexts where fertilization cannot occur, as in same-sex interactions or asexual parthenogenetically reproducing species, can be particularly useful to understand these other fitness effects. But we should not assume that same-sex sexual behavior evolved from an ancestral state of exclusive different sex sexual behavior. Exclusive heterosexuality requires sexual identity markers and precise mate discrimination mechanisms that presumably carry costs. And where they occur, these likely evolved sometime after the origin of anisogamy. Monk et al. suggest the notion that same-sex sexual behavior is a recently evolved and distinct phenomenon from heterosexual sex, rather than one component of the messy, tangled spectrum of behaviors, traits, and strategies that we clumsily refer to as sex and sexual behavior. This is symptomatic of the kinds of binary essentialism that hinder not only social liberation and equity, but also scientific discovery. So what we hypothesize as an ancestral state changes our expectations of both likely patterns of diversity and potential causal mechanisms, um, affecting what we notice, what we look for, what we measure, what we report. And only by actually studying all the sexual behavior, same sex and different sex, can we actually assess the evolutionary alternatives. And you know, we don't have enough data yet, of course, but I think that the idea of ancestrally indiscriminate sexual behavior is worth testing. Binary thinking and a focus on differences between categories constrains and impoverishes our study of variation. It limits the kinds of questions we ask and the conceptual tools we apply, and it generates misunderstandings. This is clearly problematic for studies of sex, sexes, and sexual phenotypes, but dispensing with binary thinking in other realms is also necessary to see and study natural variation and the complex mosaic nature of associations among traits. We know this, but we don't always apply that knowledge. So I'll give you three examples from my lab, all of which began with simple observations of unexpected variation. But first, a little backstory. So, I grew up in Canada and Kenya, so I always knew there wasn't just one right way to live. And I figured out my queerness as a biology sophomore. I started taking women's studies courses and I became a feminist and a queer activist. But there was no space for those ideas at the time in my biology classes. And I understood sexual diversity to be a kind of peculiar human thing with no parallel in other animals. I considered grad school and women's studies, but really wasn't much more queer friendly than biology and I didn't like working indoors. So I continued working as a naturalist and I loved teaching people about nature. And I particularly loved working with snakes. Their alien elegance and misunderstood nature appealed to my queer sensibilities. So thinking maybe I could study snakes, I went back to university and I took the herpetology course that had not fit into my undergraduate schedule. I learned about reproductive mode diversity in frogs, which basically blew my queer Canadian mind. I had no idea that range of variation was even possible in one vertebrate order. Wow. In Canada, frogs just put their eggs in the water and go away. But in the tropics, frogs have an amazing variety of ways to reproduce and live their lives. And looking at my career now, that lecture was probably the most impactful hour of my life, right? And it gave me a path to continue in biology. Okay, so herpetology unites a 
queer combination of creatures, but the weirdness of the mix seemed to me, potentially, uh, to make space for a diversity of thought as a kind of interdisciplinarity internal to the field. So I did my master's with Richard Wasserstuck, studying behavior in a morphology lab and tadpoles in a medical school, which did not seem odd to me considering my personal life. And I published this work in 1992. But before that, I contributed to this book by any other name, a groundbreaking anthology considered a catalyst for the bisexual rights movement, one of the top 100 queer books of the 20th century. And I used a pseudonym because I was applying to PhD programs in the United States and US immigration was denying entry to queer activists. Okay, so I went to the US to Mike Ryan's lab to study the behavior and integrative biology of tropical frogs. But I actually hadn't thought about the fact that everyone else in the lab was studying sexual selection. Now, males compete for females and females choose males to mate with. And I did not want to make frog heterosexuality the focus of my PhD work. I was more interested in matters of life and death, and I wanted to focus on early life stages so the sex of my animals would be unknown and irrelevant. So I went to Costa Rica looking for a frog and a question for my research. I was introduced to the beautiful red-eyed tree frog, which lays terrestrial eggs on leaves over pond, and then at hatching their tadpoles fall into the water. And I started monitoring egg fates at this pond. All the little pink flags mark egg clutches. And what I saw was snake predation, a lot of predation. And I also accidentally bumped a well-developed clutch and I saw a few embryos hatch. It was quick. Thinking about this, I came up with the hypothesis of adaptive plasticity and hatching timing. I thought maybe embryos use hatching to escape from snakes, but maybe predators in the water select against early hatching if less developed tadpoles are more likely to be eaten. When I presented this hypothesis at a conference, some senior colleagues were very skeptical. They thought it was impossible for frog embryos to escape from a snake by hatching and impossible for a few days of development to affect tadpole survival in the water. At the time, there was a conceptual distance between how we thought about eggs as passively developing propagules that didn't really do much versus larvae, which were active behaving animals uh, interacting with their environment. And within species, Hatching was considered a developmental event that had occurred at a particular stage, even though we knew among species um, there was variation in hatching stage, but hatching was definitely not seen as an informed behavioral decision. Well, I didn't quite see this dichotomy, so I tested my hypothesis of plasticity. I set up egg predation experiments using captive snakes. I monitored for escape hatching at the pond. I surveyed for tadpole predators, and then I set up experiments to measure hatchling survival. Then I submitted my results for publication. One reviewer wrote, every herpetologist knows that if you jiggle well-developed frog eggs, they hatch. It doesn't mean anything. They seem to think snakes were inadvertently breaking already weakened egg capsules partway through a slow hatching process and releasing the passive embryos. I'd simply made a trivial misinterpretation. Okay, so just so we're clear, this is what escape hatching looks like. The snake jiggles the clutch as it feeds, creating these vibrational cues. Watch this embryo. Okay, that little wiggle, uh, it's made a decision to hatch. This is start of hatching behavior. You'll see the reflection change. So, okay, the egg is leaking, it's made a hole. Now it's gonna struggle to enlarge that hole and escape very unpassively. So over the years, we have learned about many aspects of escape hatching behavior in red-eyed tree frogs, from ecology and evolutionary history to the sensory cues that embryos use to the mechanisms that underlie the stability and how they change as embryos develop. And actually, we know environmentally cued hatching is widespread in amphibians, and embryos respond to many abiotic and biotic factors. And it, it's even found throughout bilateria. 
And now other people are studying cued hatching both directly and then using it to ask other kinds of questions. Like how does hydration affect thermal physiology and the voluntary thermal maximum of embryos? This is not a question that I would have thought to ask, but Caroline Guevara Molina is using hatching to do it. And you can learn more about her work on Friday. And also check out the talk by Elena Gomez in the same session. So I think that this kind of trajectory from unasked question to impossible concept, to trivial misinterpretation, to maybe isolated weird case, to motivating possibility, to general phenomena, um, to background foundational knowledge. This, this is probably not unusual for novel ideas in science as evidence accumulates, but it highlights the importance of unasked questions and the fact that one person's impossible concept is another person's motivating possibility. I cannot have been the first biologist to bump into a red-eyed tree frog, egg clutch, and see a few eggs hatch. It happens all the time in the field. Um, and the fact that some terrestrial amphibian eggs hatch when flooded has been known for a very long time. So why did I see a possibility where others had not? And what motivated me to pursue hatching plasticity as a potentially general phenomenon? I think that both my migratory boundary crossing history and my queer non-binary life have shaped my thinking and interests. I know very well the experience of leaving a familiar, but in some ways constraining uh, environment for a different place with new possibilities and unknown risks of being balanced at a point of decision, weighing costs and benefits. And that experience has given me what my partner Andine calls imaginative micro empathy for hatching embryos. And imaginative micro empathy generates testable hypotheses. Okay, frog lesson number two. My first PhD student Justin Touchon worked on hourglass tree frogs in another frog lineage that independently evolved terrestrial eggs that they hang over ponds and swamps. And for context, terrestrial frog eggs evolved over 50 times from ancestrally aquatic eggs. But there's a physiological trade-off between oxygen and water availability. So terrestrial eggs can suffocate underwater and aquatic eggs dry out on land. And extant frogs were known to lay either aquatic eggs or terrestrial eggs. So it really wasn't clear how these evolutionary changes could occur. Then one day, Justin decided to collect eggs at this pond where we knew there was a good chorus. Surprisingly, he found none. So that was weird. So we went back at night to follow the frogs and we saw this, hourglass tree frogs laying eggs in the water. This was really surprising. And it could be that we had even seen these eggs in the water before, but just never thought they could be laid by a terrestrial breeding species. This observation opened new possibilities for research into this repeated evolutionary transition from aquatic to terrestrial reproduction. So in experiments, Justin found that breeding pairs of frogs assess local conditions and make plastic behavioral choices between terrestrial and aquatic egg laying. And then selection pressures vary among ponds. So eggs survive better on land in some places and they survive better in the water in other places. And then in comparative work, Justin found five other species of dendrobsophus that show similar plasticity and phylogenetic support that uh, this plasticity may play a role in transitions from aquatic to fixed terrestrial egg laying. And he found variation among populations of hourglass tree frogs, including some places where they only lay terrestrial eggs and individual variation in this population that he's now using as the basis for a selection experiment that might tell us a lot genetically about how terrestrial reproduction evolves. So clearly the boundary between aquatic and terrestrial eggs is more permeable even today than what we had thought. And this whole research trajectory emerged from noticing and taking seriously the absence of eggs where they should have been. Okay, frog lesson three. Jesse D'Elia, 
joined my lab in 2011 to study glass frogs, which lay eggs on plants over streams, another independent origin of terrestrial eggs. And we knew that about 20% of glass frog species, fathers brood and guard their eggs, and the rest were thought to have no parental care. Then, with his collaborator, Laura Bravo Valencia, very late at night, they noticed females sitting on eggs just for a few hours before dawn. Was this also parental care? Well, through lab and field experiments, Jesse and Laura found that the hydration that females deliver during this very brief period of egg brooding provides essential protection from predation and from drying. And Jesse and Laura's fieldwork completely changed our understanding of parental care and sex roles in this entire frog family. It now seems that all glass frogs have and need parental care. Male care evolved three times from female care, and every time males took over caring, it became longer and more elaborate. Males care the longest in lineages where they mate multiply, and care duration increases with individual mating success. So minimalist maternal care and elaborate extensive paternal care runs counter to conventional sexual theory, which works better for mammals than it does for frogs or fish or insects. And the variation in glass frog parenting and repeated transitions offer great opportunities to ask new questions. So for instance, Jesse and Laura found that different suites of parental traits are functionally equivalent. And they argue that egg clutch phenotypes may provide a general mechanism for parental coevolution across the sexes in species that only have uniparental care. So Jesse and Laura were not the first people to see a female glass frog sitting on a newly laid clutch, but both the normative expectation that parental care lasts longer than a few hours and the prior knowledge that glass, glass frog fathers uh, care for eggs likely caused others to dismiss such observations as trivial rather than do the work to test the function of this behavior. We now think care occurs in 10 to 20% of frogs. It's super diverse and evolved many, many times, creating fantastic opportunities for comparative work. Male, female, and biparental care are all widespread, especially in terrestrial breeders. Male care evolved as often as female care, and there's no sex bias in care duration or level of protection. So looking at this, the idea that anisogamy somehow leads to female care seems empirically unconvincing. So these examples from my lab illustrate the value of following up on weird observations, particularly those that may disrupt binaries and reveal variation across what we thought were categorical boundaries. Feminist neuroscientists describe a gender binary cycle in which a biological essentialist view of gender, non-egalitarian binar binary gender ideology, and gender-based labeling and sorting are all mutually reinforcing. Linguists have shown that categorization actually changes our perceptions. Developmental psychologists have demonstrated that sorting the environment, even using arbitrarily assigned t-shirt color markers, generates cognitive biases. But an essentialist binary view of gender is built on a binary view of biological sex that actually conflicts with our understanding of both evolutionary and developmental variation. So learning just a little about reproductive diversity helped me to stay in biology decades ago. Today, I think biology has a lot more to offer queer folk, gender and sexuality scholars, and people interested in human diversity more broadly. So we need to stop treating males and females as fundamentally different kinds, even as a shortcut, and study them as different phenotypic expressions of shared underlying potential. So this is abundantly clear for hermaphrodites or species with environmental sex determination, 
but transitions between sex determination systems are common and environmental reversals of genetic sex reveal hidden developmental capacity of individuals and allow new sexual systems to evolve. And just as sex change is an active process, so is sex stability. Gonad identity is actively maintained and repressing a single transcription factor in adult mice can cause ovaries to change to testes or vice versa. We think of anisogamy, a gamete size binary, as the most fundamental sex difference. And that works for most animals, although some have very large sperm. But anisogamous sexes evolved multiple times. And in other lineages, the size binary can be somewhat less stable. Gorlick et al. found no universal criteria for distinguishing females from males, not within each origin of sexes, and definitely not across all the origins of sexes. Beyond gonads, the suites of traits associated with making larger small gametes vary substantially, even among closely related species. Males, females, both or neither may express weapons, ornaments, or parental care. Cross-sexual transfer of trait expression by genetic or environmental effects on the mechanisms of sex-specific trait expression generates new trait combinations. And following Wes Tieperhart, I think this is a common but neglected form of phenotypic recombination. It's probably as important for evolution as duplication or deletion or heterochrony. And the modular hierarchical asynchronous development of different sex traits facilitates mosaic expression of combination of ancestrally male and female traits as a part of endosex variation, intersex development, and evolutionary cross-sexual transfer. Intraspecific variation in sexual phenotypes from common sex-limited alternative morphs to rare developmental variants reveals such mosaic recombination and the developmental diversity that enables evolutionary change. So in humans, Sexual development, even at the most basic level of genetics, gonads, and genitals, is also complex and variable. So not all people fit clearly into male and female categories. This variation is a spectrum or a multivariate mosaic, and there's certainly debate about who and how many people count as intersex. But the current best estimate is about 1.7%, meaning intersex people are more common in the US than of females over five foot nine inches and about 13 times more common than those my height. So from frogs, we know that many human made chemicals can affect endocrine systems, alter sexual development and impair reproduction. And the prevalence of these chemicals is a serious environmental problem. But frogs can also show natural sex reversal, generating sex typical phenotypes unmatched to genotype. And intersex frogs also occur in uncontaminated contexts. Moreover, phenotypes considered intersex in one species may be typical in another, such as the female ovotestes that characterize at least eight species of moles. Such phenotypes may be neutral or maladaptive in one species or one context and adaptive in another, as argued for moles. So our understanding of the diversity of sexual phenotypes in nature and people is increasing, but there's still a lot to learn. We don't know how future discoveries will change our knowledge, but we do know that sometimes what we think we know is wrong. And some unasked, perhaps unimagined questions will be transformative. Oversimplifying sexual biology strengthens socially and scientifically harmful binary sex and gender essentialism, and likely contributes to the attrition of gender and sexual minorities, and probably even cisgender heterosexual women from science. Studying and teaching the variation and complexity inherent in sexual phenotypes can help create space for diverse perspectives and working together across all of our differences can generate new insights and help us discover more of the amazing diversity of life. 
Okay, I'd like to thank my students and collaborators and colleagues across disciplines for expanding my thinking and my world and all of the work that we've done together. I thank my mentors and advocates, my biological and chosen family and funding agencies for their support. I thank you all for listening. I'll leave you with a quote from Janet Leonard and I will be happy to answer questions. The unfortunate part of these webinars is that you can hear the hundreds of people clapping right now. That was a fantastic <laughs> talk. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you for broadening our views too. Um, I'm gonna remind people to please write your questions in the Q&A window. So I see a lot of people now in the chat are clap, clap, an incredible talk, thank you very much. So while we're waiting for people to add questions to the Q&A window, I know others want already. Well, let's start with Jen, you said you had a question you wanted to post. Sure, I was, uh, so great talk, um, amazing insights. I'm curious if along your journey, there was something that when you would share with others that they found to be most surprising and maybe that shifted some of your ways of thinking, um, you shared, yeah. You know, I don't know. I feel like there are so many things. I mean, I, I have actually been, so I, I you know, I've been teaching uh, in gender and sexuality studies since 2011, but I also started teaching just like sex for biologists uh, in 2002. And there's so many things that I said then that I thought we knew that have turned out to be wrong. Like, um, you know, the fact that that facultative or sporadic parthenogenesis occurs in all kinds of species that uh, are typically sexual, you know, that, that was not something I knew. And then it turns out like, in fact, we knew this, we knew this for a long time because it like showed up in, in uh, domestic birds and people who were even like trying to, to breed it, but then it just like disappeared. And somehow, you know, I didn't, I didn't learn that. Um, or, you know, also when I, when I was starting to teach about sex, there was this idea, I mean, there were books, there were science papers, whatever, on like mitochondria and uniparental inheritance as this like, you know, major, this like, is this the most fundamental sex binary organelle wars drive, you know, male and female phenotypes apart, all of this. And then, you know, but there's like so many ways around that, like Gorlick et al. didn't even look at that because, you know, no, so clearly like lots of biparental inheritance, uniparent, double uniparental inheritance, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's like, we, we keep trying to find these things. We keep trying to draw these like hard and fast lines. And then, you know, like the world is like, no, <laughs> you know, there's more variation. Um, so, so I can't think of a, a, a single example. I mean, the, this, these papers on the mice uh, where, you know, they blocked a transcription factor and, you know, they see like the, you know, gonads reversing sex in adult mice. That, that kind of, that's a, like a recent blow my mind thing. Um, yeah, there, there's, I think, I think the plethora of, of examples is more, um, you know, more striking than any one particular one. <laughs> Thank you for that answer, Karen. We have a question from Stephen Cassidy. How might the descriptive terminology we use, like feminization, affect the way we study the biology of sex? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I, I'm sure that it does. I mean, there's so many ways. I only know like a little bit from the sort of linguistics literature, but it is very clear that the terminology that we use affects how we think and like the, the possibilities that we even consider uh, or the questions that we ask. So, um, and, and there are like many things that even, I mean, I keep changing and trying to figure out better ways of, of talking about things. I don't think I'm, you know, I'm sure I, that will continue. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think when we, but definitely when we, when we categorize something, I mean, so like I, I just changed one of my, 
one of my slides right before the the plenary because I you know we're talking about mosaic recombination of male and female traits I'm like how are these male and female traits and then I just added ancestral it's like okay that that actually is more correct and more clear because like if it's a male trait but now it's being expressed by a female is it still a male trait it's you know the language is inadequate and you know of course language is inadequate in many ways and we change the language and we make up new terms and we find better ways of talking about things and then when we do that lets us you know see things that we weren't seeing before um, or it can and you need like somebody to see beyond that you know that barrier and then push the rest of us to to go there Thank you, Karen. From group crash and five likes, this might be more of a personal question. How did you find the confidence as a PhD student or postdoc to get past that reviewer telling you that your observations were meaningless? I will find that very demoralizing. Well, I have to say, and, and you know, like in other talks I've, I've given, I've, I've talked more about this, but um, I think if you, as long as you have some people, even a few people who are like supporting you, um, that can make a huge difference. So, you know, if, if like everyone had thought like that, I think it would have been much harder for me, but I certainly had friends, I had lab mates, you know, my grand was, you know, not, not bound by, by these, you know, perspectives that, that the reviewers or, you know, as I said, some senior colleagues who, you know, like later came around once they saw more things. And of course I didn't have videos um, at that time. And, you know, like the videos really helped, but, you know, when I'm there and I'm like watching these things happen, it's very clear to me that, you know, this is, this is not a passive process. And now we have like, you know, we have much better videos even than the first ones and, and now, it's, it's obvious to anyone, but, but support networks, even a few people who, who believe in you or listen to you are really important. And that is like something that we all can do um, for our students, for each other, for, you know, um, yeah. Thank you. From Siki Gonzalez, incredible talk. Thank you so much. There is an overarching paradigm in sexual selection that we study competition between counters and the choice of the courted, oh, be, between quarters, I'm sorry. Quarters, yeah. And the choice of the courted. And this is often approached from the dichotomous approach of male and female. How would you suggest we break outside that paradigm to ask new and valuable questions? Well, so, so in, in Gil Rosenthal, my academic brother, um, book on May choice. Uh, he uses quarter and courted, uh, he, like tries to use that a lot and not, not be assuming who's doing the courting and who's being courted. And I, I think that's, that's definitely uh, a step. Um, I think another, another element or, or component, um, is that we need to, to think about sexual selection in a broader context. So um, Jay Falk, uh, for instance, uh, yesterday talked about, about social selection, another concept from Mary Jane Westy Berhart, where we can think about sort of nested layers, right? Of, of um, you know, all of natural selection, some of which is from you know entirely non-social processes to then things that are social, but could be like any conspecific, right? And with any social process, you could have you know you could have runaways, you could have things that counter uh, survival selection, etc. And then there's like the the narrower uh, still process of sexual selection, and you know I think that even Many things, so in the, in the sort of sexual selection world in that research, when we find sexual selection, we tend to say, okay, well, this, this explains these exaggerated traits or, you know, whatever, the, the, some, some feature of animals. Whereas it might, you know, many traits could be used for competition 
for mates, and they also could be used for competition for food or competition for housing or competition for like any other resource that's important to uh, animals, you know, individual or inclusive fitness. Um, and so we, I, you know, I kind of think we're, we're not even fully understanding, um, you know, what's going on with, you know, weaponized males if we, if we are just looking at it in a sexual selection context. I don't know, there's a little bit of a tangent, but I hope it, it helped. Thank you so much. Well, there are a bunch of questions still in the Q&A, but it is time for us to hear about hyenas. <laughs> 